If you've been going around the good old internet looking for the right podcast to fulfill your New York Yankees needs, well, I'll be the first to deliver the good news to you. You have found it. Here on Yapping Yankees with me, your host, Mike Scudero, you and I will be discussing the latest news, takes, and talk throughout the entire Yankee universe. Oh, and there may be some ranting on my behalf. Yeah. Anyway, what do you say we get to it? Let's get to yapping! Well, hello there, my fellow Yankee fans, and welcome to episode 203 of the Yapping Yankees podcast, where we yap about the Yanks and nothing but those Yanks. As always, I am your host, Mike Scudero, here on December 3rd, 2023, as we round out this year with the final month of it. Can you believe it? I can't. Another thing I can't believe, it is time for the winter meetings already. Feels like two minutes ago that we only spoke two weeks ago about the anticipation for the winter meetings and all that could take place here, my friends. Cannot believe it has arrived. It is my favorite time of the MLB offseason, where, of course, there's always the chance, doesn't necessarily always pan out this way, but there's always the chance of the most happening over the course of these next few days. And of course, it just started today on December 3rd, and it's going to be going all the way until the 6th. And in that time, any trade could be made, any signing could be made, no matter how big or small. And of course, the big ones are the ones that everybody's talking about. There's so much anticipation going on out there. Everything we have spoken about for weeks now and more, we're going to cover it today. Even the things I've already covered, and I've covered the vast majority of it, but obviously some things have gotten a bit more hotter in these last couple of weeks because that happens, you know, as the weeks go along, certain discussions cool down, certain discussions get hot, certain discussions stay hot, and uh, that's just the nature of the beast, my friends, but it has gotten crazy the last few days in particular in anticipation, in immediate anticipation of the winter meetings. Because with them already beginning today, all of the topics that have been thrown around, they've been getting even more intense, whether they be aligned reports or conflicting reports amongst all the Major League Baseball reporters out there. You name them, Joel Sherman, John Heyman, Jeff Passan, Ken Rosenthal, Buster Olney. You can run down the list of all the reporters just shooting stuff out there. Andy Martino, another one, a big one that people are following because his reporting has been accurate lately. But there are just topics up and down, guys. Soto, Bellinger, Otani, and they're saying that a deal could come through for him within the next week, maybe even within the next few days. Even talk on star reliever Josh Hader is hot. And an additional outfield candidate, for the Yankees too, possibly, that's being posted to Major League Baseball for free agency tomorrow from the KBO in Korea, Young Hoo Lee. Sorry if I mispronounced that, but that is... The best attempt that I've had based off what I've heard. But lots of candidates going around, guys. Lots of talk, just... And the reports, just whether they align with each other or they're against each other, what to believe, who to not believe, who could be playing an angle, who could be putting pressure on one side. It's exhausting. That's the one thing. Like, all the off-season chatter is a lot of fun, and it's exhilarating and it's really fun to speculate and put together trade packages speculate how much money somebody could sign for the amount of years they might sign for all that's really good but then you can only really go off of what you hear that's reported and some things are just blatantly against each other and you don't know who to believe and if it's a report coming from an agent or a gm they could be playing up their side putting more pressure on whoever it is they're negotiating with So it might not be 100% the truth. And also there's the negotiations process itself where you might start high and then it comes down back down to earth a little bit, which is kind of what we're seeing with the Soto situation right now, which I'll get to in a second. But yeah, there's just a ton going on. Tons. So I do hope you are all doing well out there personally and also doing well to weather this chaotic storm that is the Major League Baseball offseason. Nothing out of the ordinary, of course. This usually happens every single year, this kind of chaos, but there are a lot of huge names up for debate right now, whether it be via trade or signing, does not matter, a lot of them. But I actually wanted to start with Young Hu Lee in Korea, because this guy's been a hot topic of late. 
especially with certain people getting a bit discouraged with what they've been hearing about talks between the Yankees and the Padres about Juan Soto, and of course hearing recent numbers speculated about Cody Bellinger as well, who I see as plan B if Soto doesn't work out, maybe even Young Hu Lee could be a plan 1A sort of, I don't really know. It depends on how things shake out here and whether or not Soto actually really happens, which of course, as we all know, I've made it more than clear, that's the one I'm rooting for, for obvious reasons. I just I just happen to think that there is not a box out there that Juan Soto does not check as far as what the Yankees are in need of. But Lee is definitely a very interesting candidate here. And I've done a lot more research on him over the last week because, admittedly so, before a week or two ago, I did not know a lot about this kid. But he is definitely fascinating after looking him up a bit and just analyzing his stats, hearing the kind of player he is, hearing people around him, the way they talk about him, all the kind of things. you got to really dive deep when you look into these guys. And I looked into the numbers in particular, definitely first off, that's really the first thing I go to usually. I see he's a 340 hitter in almost 900 games in the KBO. Almost 900 games. 340. Been playing since 2017. He's only 25 years old, which, by the way, is the same age that Soto is right now. Just a little fun fact. They're both 25. He has never, Lee has never hit under 300 in a season. Been described as putting up Tony Gwynn-type numbers. It's a lot of what I've heard. In other words... You want someone who makes a lot of contact and gets on base a ton? This could be someone you like. (laughs) There's no guarantee about how it'll translate to the big leagues here in America with Major League Baseball, but at least as of how he plays in Korea, lots of good stuff. He has a career on base percentage hovering around 410 at the moment. OPS in the high 890s too, so right around 900 in his career. Which puts his slugging in the high 490s just south of 500. And again, he's being posted tomorrow on day two of the winter meeting. So who knows? A signing for him could get done just days or maybe even the day of of being posted. Not very likely, but who knows? Who knows? When you have teams out there who are looking for outfielders as desperately as the Yankees are and elite talent at that, you never know. You never know. But this kid is definitely someone worth looking into. I saw he plays all outfield positions if needed, so the versatility in the outfield is terrific, and it's well played as well on top of that. So this kid is very enticing. My number one is still Juan Soto, still is, but I definitely would not mind Lee as being another candidate, and he has definitely heated up discussion-wise in the last couple of weeks especially. And then, of course, the one that I want the most, you have Juan Soto. I've been talking about him for months, how badly I want him on this team. Reports started out a bit conflicting. Padres GM and Scott Boris, who is Juan Soto's agent, of course, saying that he is definitely in the plans for at least the first half of 2024 for the Padres because they plan on legitimately competing and having him being right in the middle of that. But then you had guys like Jeff Passan, Buster Olney, even Ken Rosenthal a little bit there, all saying that they are more or less claiming that it is all but guaranteed that Juan Soto is going to be traded. So it's like, who the hell do we listen to here? (laughs) Bunch of reliable reporters saying that he is definitely going to be dealt because the Padres need good young pitching talent and to shed payroll desperately. And then you have the Padres GM and Juan Soto's agent saying that he's not going anywhere. For sure. They could be working their angles. The reporters could be getting wrong information. Both could be telling the truth. One side could be changing their mind. You never know. There's just so much. But then, the last couple of weeks, we've been hearing that there's actually been legitimate discussion instead of just preliminary and just basic discussion between the two sides, the Yankees and the Padres being. And it's heated up just in the last few days alone to the extreme. So much so to the point that as of now, In the last couple of days, we've actually gotten word of the legitimate package that the Padres very well could have requested of the Yankees for this trade to happen. Now, could this eventually come down? Yes. Am I hoping it comes down? Yes. Because as of right now, I will even objectively say, this is a tall ask, folks. Especially when considering, you have to remember, 
Juan Soto, as of right now, as of this moment, this could change immediately upon trading for him. Or maybe even after 2024. You never know when or if it could even change. As of this moment, Juan Soto is a one-year rental. Now, I have been very level-headed with this, despite how much I want him. In some cases, I've been pretty irrational about it because of how badly I want Juan Soto and pinstripes, and rightfully and understandably so, objectively. (laughs) But I've also been level-headed about it. I've said many times in the last few weeks, you could literally pick it out in probably each episode going back weeks and weeks. One condition that I have for the Juan Soto deal to be really solid in my mind, and where I'd be really willing to give up a lot more than I otherwise would, there has to be an extension in the discussion. Because if you're really viewing him as a one-year rental, obviously the ask can't be nearly as much as the former, if you're expecting an extension. If you're really confident that you're going to extend him maybe after the season's over, in which case he'd still be a one-year rental until after the season, and therefore the asking price still really can't be that high, then fine. But if you're really, like, including an extension, like, upon the trade happening, like, that soon, because he's entering his last year of arbitration, going to make a lot of money, 30-plus. So that's the problem here. So if it is, in fact, just a rental, and right now it is, then this package I'm about to read out to you, if you haven't seen it already with your own eyes, is going to be a bit ridiculous. Here's the package. In order to get Juan Soto over to New York, the Yankees to be specific, if he went across town, I'd nosedive off my roof. What it would have to take, according to the Padres GM, and again, this could come down, that's how negotiating works. Sometimes you start ridiculous and you work your way down. Michael King, Clark Schmidt, prospect Drew Thorpe, Randy Vasquez, Johnny Brito, two other prospects that have not been named as of yet, And the Yankees would also be taking on outfielder Trent Grisham from San Diego. Padres are really looking to cut payroll. And Juan Soto going is really going to do that for them. That's really the main reason why they're looking into doing this. That's a tall ask for a one-year rental, guys. And yes, Juan Soto is a generational talent. Yes, I believe there is not one box out there that he does not check as far as what the Yankees need. Yes, I want him very badly. I really do. And a big part of me just wants to say, screw this, do it. Even with the rental, screw it. But objectively, when you put emotions aside, for a player that as of this very moment, factually and objectively, is a one-year rental... That is a tall ask. Because right now, here's what you're looking at. You're looking at four major league pitchers, being Michael King, Clark Schmidt, Randy Vasquez, and Johnny Brito, guys who have pitched in the major leagues already at one point or another. Top five Yankee prospect, Drew Thorpe, who's also a top 100 in America, by the way, 99 to be exact, plus another two prospects. And the Yankees would take on Trent Grisham as well who is an awful hitter. So, it's a lot. And if you plug it into just about any trade simulator, the value going to San Diego as opposed to the one coming back is a vast difference. Vast. So it's a tall ask from San Diego, and all the reports right now are saying, they're all aligned with each other, that in light of this tall ask, Talks between the Yankees and the Padres have completely stalled as of right now here on Sunday night. I'm recording very late. It's past 8 o'clock right now. But as of right now, there's no additional word on this, but the talks have apparently completely stalled. And now the team that you're hearing emerging as a potential front runner in these Soto discussions, which is really freaking me out a little bit, And this could definitely be a tactic to put pressure on the Yankees, so I'm really just trying to be patient here, but a little bit, it's freaking me out. The Blue Jays have apparently emerged as a frontrunner, which I'm really not understanding how, because they don't really have the young pitching talent that the Yankees could provide for San Diego, so I'm not really sure how a package could go through like that, unless, and this is very possible too, in which case I will voluntarily go and play in rush hour traffic. It is very possible, because we have seen this before. That certain organizations 
really give the Yankees a harder time than they do others. So it could definitely happen, just to torment me, of course, that they have this package that they're demanding of the Yankees for Juan Soto, and they go to the Blue Jays, and then they trade him to Toronto for half the package, if that. You really stick it to the Yankees real nice. Nobody feels bad for the Yankees. No, send me over the edge, though. (laughs) You better believe that. And the thing that really freaks me out about that is, well, duh, the Blue Jays are in the division. We'd have to face Juan Soto on a regular basis after how badly we all wanted him. That'd be so cruel. Oh, my God, it'd be awful. So that's freaking me out a little bit. But when it comes to Juan Soto, I'm trying to really stay grounded and patient as much as I possibly can because it is making me very nervous because I want him on this team so badly, guys. I want him so badly on the Yankees. My God. Lefty hitting, young, stud, generational talent, World Series champion in his late teens, plays a solid outfield, gets on base, has a great eye at the plate, and all this in Yankee Stadium. Come on. (laughs) And if you want to extend him, you don't have to worry about giving him like 12 years, because even if you give him 12 years, it's not like you're signing him through to being 41, 42 years old like some other massive contracts of the past. If you sign him right now to a 12-year deal, he's only going to be like 37. And yeah, he might have declined a little bit by then, but it's better than being signing someone until they're 42 or even 40. He's still just going to be in his mid to late 30s. That's the benefit of being able to sign somebody to a long-term contract this young. He's still so young. Oh, my God. Like I said, there is not a box that is unchecked. So, yeah, I'm freaking out a little bit. And the reports have been rampant just the last couple of days on Juan Soto and the talks between the two of them and now the Blue Jays emerging. But, again, that could be a negotiation tactic to put some pressure on the Yankees. Who really knows at the end of the day? Could be Boris giving information to the media on purpose. Just so many potential scenarios playing out here. That's why I'm really just trying my best to sit on my hands and be patient and see how it all plays out. If it is going to play out, then these next four days could really end up being really exciting here up until the 6th, which is, of course, Wednesday. So it's going on today, and then it'll continue through Wednesday. And if anything does happen big time, by the way, this week, I did mention this with my off-season bi-weekly plans. This even took place last year as well. This applied for that as well. But if something major does happen this week, like let's say the Yankees trade for Juan Soto, something that humongous, I will be back with another episode next week to talk about it. You best believe. I can't wait two weeks to talk about the Yankees trading for me. Are you kidding me? <laughs> That's not going to happen. So I will be back next Sunday, the 10th, if the Yankees do anything of note over the course of this next week, particularly with the winter meetings. So if there is going to be a week this offseason where I come back the very next Sunday with it happening and you feel real good about the chances of it happening, it's going to be this week for next Sunday if they do anything for the winter meetings. And that might not just be exclusive to Juan Soto. As of tomorrow, it could be for Lee. It could be for Bellinger. It could be for Yamamoto. I mean, really anything. A lot of people are even saying, oh, it could be for Otani too. The Yankees are not getting Otani, guys. <laughs> it's not happening. I, I saw some articles going around today. Just a quick little tangent here going off the rails a bit. But I even saw some article today, you know, along with talking about how Otani could get done over the course of this week, especially during the winter meetings. But alongside saying that, they're saying, oh, he could be Major League Baseball's first $600 million man. I, I just, I don't see it. And some people might be saying, Mike, what the hell are you talking about? It's Shohei Otani. Well, at least as of this year, I don't see it. Let's say if by some miracle he only signs to like a one or two year contract with a high AAV, you know, annual average of earning. Let's say he signs to a one or two year deal. And then after that, he proves he could pitch again and be back to his old self, really. Then, yeah, I guess I can understand it. He returns to being a two-way player. But he's not even going to be pitching this year. And people are saying, oh, he's going to go to the outfield. Well, he hasn't played the outfield in the major leagues, really. What, he played like around a dozen games in the outfield in 2021? Going on three years ago now? I mean, it it could turn out to be pretty bad. I don't know. Who, Who knows? So, oh, he could be an outfielder. Well, it's not pitching. And hitting, yeah, he's really good, but... $600 million? 
Oh my God. So yeah, I just I don't see how that could be going in right now, going into 2024 when he's not going to pitch. Oh, he's going to be in the outfield. Well, he played maybe around a dozen games out there years ago. So it's not guaranteed that it'll work out too well. And he's had his injury problems here and there, primarily with pitching, yes. But, and while he's a solid hitter, definitely, more than solid, $600 million worth of solid? I, I, I don't know. I don't get it. You want to sign him to like a year or two? So you see how he does in 24 and give him a bunch of money for this year and next year if it's a one depending on whether it's a one or two year deal. Give him a bunch of money in both years if you want. Fine. And then when he comes back in 2025, see how he pitches again to, as like a sort of a test run. And if he does well and still hits well on top of that, then yeah, then you sign him to a humongous contract. But going into this year, I mean, I know there's a year of free agency, but like I don't know. I, I just think it's really foolish to sign well, any one human in that kind of money, number one. But two, especially when half of the reason why you'd even do that is not even in play right now. He's not going to be pitching in 24. And you're going to give him like $600 million? Oh my God. I don't know. So I, I just think that's crazy thinking about it personally. Some people may call me an idiot for having that opinion. Fine, you can call me an idiot if you want. But I, I just, as of this very moment... Given the current circumstances, I'm not saying this applies to when he has both elements of his game back and he's a two-way player again between the pitching and the hitting. It's not what I'm saying. I'm saying as of the current situation right now where he is not going to be pitching in 2024 and there's no guarantees that he could get his mojo back as it was before for 25. That's why I'm saying you could possibly even sign him for two years and see how he does again in 2025 on the mound and then make your decision after that. Right now, I just think it's it's pretty insane to want to sign that kind of money given the current circumstances but right now they're saying that's down to a very small amount of teams for him right now which is why some people are anticipating that a deal for him gets done within the next few days which is going to be very interesting to see Bellinger just circling around all the candidates I suppose apparently he's seeking money that is 250 mil or higher and for a long-term deal, heard as many as 12 years at first. And then at one point, I think it was hovering around 10, give or take. Came down a little bit. But again, guys, you know my fears about Cody Bellinger. I'm just uneasy about the guy. I'm not saying he's bad at all, and I'm not crapping on his 2023. He had a great year. But still given the circumstances, guys, you look at his career since 2019. It's a lot of, like, feast or famine. <laughs> and it's more famine. Three out of those four years amongst the worst hitters in baseball on the planet. And then last year, he bounces back, has a terrific season, reminds us of the Cody Bellinger of old. That was at the end of the 2010s, especially in 2019, the way he did. And now that warrants a huge contract. Now, there's, there's definitely risk for some sharp regression there. And just being a team's worst nightmare for years to come while paying a ton of money just because he had a good 2023. I've made my fears about this very clear. I'm not even saying that Cody Bellinger would be a bad thing. I've never said that once. I'm just saying that it makes me uncomfortable. And I think that's plenty fair given the circumstances and if you analyze his career over the last few years. There's a lot of risk and a big possibility for a downturn. And amidst that potential downturn, 10 to 12 years north of 250? It's a hell of a commitment, guys. Obviously, at that price, the higher the years go, the less the annual earnings are going to be, the AAV, obviously. But still, it's a big, long commitment. And other teams look at him, even in, in the event that you want to get rid of him years down the line. Not a, not a lot of other organizations will look at that contract and do you the favor because they won't want that kind of commitment either. So it's really, it's tough. It's really tough. That's why my list of candidates goes as follows. Still have Juan Soto at the top. And then I have, I, I think Young Hu Lee has really moved ahead of Bellinger at this point. I'd like for him to be like a 1A. And then if neither of those work out, then yeah, you go after Bellinger, obviously. You have to get a solid outfield candidate regardless of who it is if you're the Yankees. You cannot go into 
2024 without getting any of these candidates. It's just a must not. You have to get at least one, in my opinion. A lot of people are saying Soto and Bellinger or Lee and Bellinger or Lee and Soto and fine. You want to do two. If the Yankees are willing to do that, then fine. That's going to be a big commitment though and a lot of money put towards it if the Yankees are willing to do that depending on other ways they might come up with to offload payroll in order to be able to do that. A lot of factors involved as everything does usually have in the offseason. But the point is I'd be okay with getting one of those. Let's say they trade for Soto. If they get Soto, I would be totally fine, and I did say this too. I said I wouldn't be okay with this being the only move or the biggest outfield move, but if it was a side move along with the huge outfield move, then I'd be okay with it. If they get a Juan Soto, then I'd be okay with them signing someone to a smaller deal, someone like Kevin Kiermeyer to cover center field, particularly for while Jason Dominguez is out. Because then... At that point, you'll have a Juan Soto, Kevin Kiermeyer, Aaron Judge, killer outfield. That'll be straight murder. And then even when Jason Dominguez comes back on a primary basis, you'll have Kevin Kiermeyer there to do whatever you need in the outfield, which is a huge plus. And then you'll have Soto, Dominguez, Judge. Wild outfield. Either way. So I'd be fine with that. Just get one of these three candidates. If you don't get at least one of these three outfield candidates, as far as I'm concerned, the Yankees get an F, big fat F on the offseason without even a discussion. I don't want to hear debate, rhetoric, commentary, nothing. It's a failure. With Jason Dominguez being out for give or take half the year, you need two outfielders. One of them could be one of these big candidates, one of those big three, Soto, Lee, Bellinger. And the other could just be like a side piece like Kiermaier or something else. But if you're the Yankees, you need two outfield spots filled. Two. And you've got to add to the rotation. You got work to do. So whether it be Soto, Kiermaier, Yamamoto, or Lee, Kiermaier, Yamamoto, or Bellinger, Kiermaier, Yamamoto. You've got to address all three primarily. If you want to add somewhere else, fine, whatever. But those are your biggest priorities. And it's got to be. You might notice that I still stuck with Kiermaier and Yamamoto because I do think that both of them would be good. It's just Kiermaier can't be the biggest move. It can't be. Cannot be. The reason why I switch around the main three is because you need at least one of those three. Then the other ones can come into play. Unconditionally, you need Yamamoto. You need to make a rotation addition. And we've heard the reports of how much the Yankees have prioritized him. They see him as number one, as a matter of fact, you've heard in a lot of places. And some have even said, some have said, that for some time now, the Yankees have even saved the number 18 for him because they have anticipated signing him so much for when he is finally posted. The time has arrived. He is not a Yankee yet. But if they are that serious about it, they cannot fumble this. There are a lot of other candidates, both in the Yamamoto talks and even the Soto talks, especially now the Blue Jays, apparently. That's the big one. But I'm even hearing some people saying, oh, the Giants could have a major edge and Steve Cohen could step in and outbid everybody and whatnot. We've been hearing for a while how bad the Yankees want him. Brian Cashman went to Japan to watch him pitch. Won another MVP. Apparently saving the number 18 for him on top of all this. I mean, if you're the Yankees and you're that serious, you got to secure the bag. You got to get it done, bro. You you, you just have to get it done. (laughs) There's no other way of saying it. There's no other way. But the chaos is getting chaotic, you best believe, with the winter meetings having arrived. It's winter meetings time, baby. And we are off to the races, nice and quick. And even getting Lee added to the discussion on top of all the other names we've been talking about makes it even more fun. Hell, I'm here for it. But that's my plan, guys. I've said it for a while. The Yankees need at least one of those big three candidates for the outfield. 
Then if you want to get a side piece like a Kevin Kiermeyer, I'd be fine with that. And you got to get Yamamoto. You got to secure it for the rotation because I've spoken about for a while now. A lot of people are saying that, oh yeah, only the offense matters. Only the pitching matters. Yeah, I probably prioritize offense more than the pitching right now. And I've made that more than clear. I won't switch up on that. But the pitching, I'm not totally neglecting either. I've been very upfront saying that I think the Yankees need Yamamoto or just another big time arm because a lot of question marks after Garrett Cole. And speaking of pitching, which is also another big thing with the Soto package, you're giving away a lot of young pitchers if you're to do that Soto deal. If it's basically a guarantee that especially upon trading you are going to extend him, then that package becomes tempting. But especially with him just being a rental as of right now, as of this moment, seven players, guys. And the Padres are more or less regardless of how you feel about the particular candidates, they're more or less asking for an entire young rotation. Four major league pitchers, all of them have started games. And also, Yankees' top five prospect, Drew Thorpe. It's a young rotation right there. Especially Michael King, he's going to head up the deal if there is going to be any. And understandably so. The Yankees are even trying to transition into a starter as of the later part of 2023, as we saw, and he did a stellar job at it. So Michael King would be tough to lose, but you got to give something to get something. That's what we always say. And if the price does come down and they'd be just willing to take maybe a Michael King and a Drew Thorpe, maybe a Randy Vasquez and another prospect, I mean, that'd definitely be better, much more realistic than what what this current package for a rental, I mean, it's it's pretty insane. So I don't bl- I don't really blame as hard as I am on Brian Cashman and the Yankees. I don't blame them for having pause as of this. But let's say it doesn't. Let's say the trade just doesn't happen, and it comes out later on that the package was significantly less, and they still didn't go through with it. Then, <laughs> then that'll be the time for me to blow a gasket. But for now, if they're having pause on this, and it doesn't lower. I mean, as borderline clinically depressed it I'll be that Juan Soto is not a Yankee, I will not totally misunderstand. Because it's pretty... It's a lot. That's a lot. Seven guys, four of them being major league pitchers, and the fifth being a top five prospect, top 100 in all prospects in America, 99 to be exact as of right now, plus another two prospects, and taking on Trent Grisham. That is a lot for someone who, as of now, is a one-year rental, whether it be Juan Soto or whoever, doesn't matter. That's a lot. But again, I'm just mentally preparing for the scenario that the Blue Jays end up snagging him for maybe half the package, if that. We have to deal with him in the division every single year for God knows how long, however many years to come. At which point, I again voluntarily go out and play in rush hour traffic tomorrow evening. So I'm just trying to mentally prepare for that, because that's just how things go lately. And uh, that's that's really all. I'm just really praying this package comes down. And I, I, I think it could, because that's how negotiations go off in time. And the fact that the winter meetings happen right when this package was reported to be a potential reality, I think it's a good thing, because... The winter meetings will result in these two sides meeting in person. And sometimes that could be a difference maker, negotiating in person. Who knows? You you never know. But from the beginning, you've heard very reputable reporters, the most reputable of all, names like Jeff Passan, my personal favorite, and my most reliable, saying that it is basically certain that Juan Soto will be traded and Yankee fans should start to get excited because nobody can really give San Diego what the Yankees could as far as their needs i.e., in particular, young pitching. Which, with this astronomical package, is clearly what they're seeking. (laughs) So, all we can hope for is for the price to come down, guys. Because again, I have not been shy about mentioning it. Soto is my number one. It's gotta be him. If they get Lee, I will not be mad. If they get Bellinger, I won't be mad. It just leaves me a lot more uncomfortable. And for the money, just makes me uneasy. Just really does. But Soto is the guy. He's the guy. Because as exciting as Lee is too, he hasn't played in the major leagues yet. It's not a guarantee that it'll translate well. Never is a guarantee. 
I just think Soto's the best option. I've been very open about that. But if an extension is damn near certain upon, especially upon immediate acquisition of him, and especially if the package comes down a bit more and they'd be willing to alleviate a bit of that sort of pressure of seven freaking guys plus taking on Trent Grisham, I stick to what I've said before. Just about anybody, not named Aaron Judge, Garrett Cole, and maybe Jason Dominguez. Goodbye. (laughs) If you need help packing, let me know. So, that's where we stand, guys. And the reports are just flying across. I even just got one on my phone right now saying that Randy Rosarena is linked to the Mariners. That'd be interesting. Randy's a pain in the ass. It'd be nice to get him out of the AL East. So, yeah, just everything's flying in right now, guys. That's... That's what's going on. It's plain chaos. <laughs> Heyman's going nuts. Brendan Cuddy's out there reporting. You also have Ken Rosenthal, Buster Olney, bunch of the guys. I haven't really seen much of Passan. There are some tweets on the timeline right now saying that, yeah, if this happens, I will off myself. <laughs> John Heyman did apparently just tweet like less than an hour ago, Alec Manoa's name has come up in Juan Soto trade talks with the Padres and the Blue Jays. Could be a good change of scenery. (laughs) Wait, what? What even is Alec Manoa's value at this point? It's got to be like negative (laughs) 50. What does that even mean? See, this is what I'm afraid of. Just like ultimately being completely clowned. Like... The Padres going to the Yankees and saying, we want seven guys, four major league pitchers, somebody in the top 100, two additional prospects on top of that, and you guys take Trent Grisham. But then they go to the Blue Jays and say, oh, we'll take like three of your prospects and Alec Manoa. Here you go. Here's Juan Soto. That is my worst nightmare, people. (laughs) Oh, my God. I'd come on here next week and just you'd be hearing the mic. All you'd hear is just sound effects like... That'd be me airmailing the microphone out my window right in front of me. That just would not go over well at all. <laughs> so, I'm telling you, because people just, some people just torment the Yankees, man. They just do that. It really sucks. <laughs> so, that just can't happen. I'm praying, praying it doesn't. But winter meetings time, man. That's, that's uh, what's going on. Wasted no time getting into this discussion today. There's just too much going on to to waste any time. (laughs) So that's really the latest on Soto, Bellinger, even a little bit on Otani with the report saying that could get done very soon. There are a lot of things that a lot of people are saying that could get done very soon. A lot of people are saying that they'd be shocked if the Juan Soto trade talks went beyond the winter meetings. So even that could get done very soon, but who knows? So lots of stuff, lots and lots and lots and lots of stuff. (laughs) So why don't we get to some Yankees news, because in the Yankees world, some things did happen in the last couple of weeks outside of just these endless rumors just swirling constantly on this red-hot hot stove that we have going on right now. Just a few things here. I guess I'll start off with what happened a couple of weeks ago as of tomorrow. On Monday the 20th, it was announced that the Yankees signed Pirates reliever Jerry De Los Santos to a minor league deal. So a little bit of a potential depth move, seeing how he goes in the minors. If the Yankees need some extra bullpen help in 2024, they could turn to him. I don't really have a problem with this. There's never any harm done with a minor league deal, especially if if our boy Matt Blake could get a hold of somebody like this. I'll explain why I say that in a second, because the guy happens to throw pretty hard. Sharp sinker, good stuff overall. Sound familiar with certain others that Blake has worked his magic on? Maybe someone like a uh, Clay Holmes, perhaps. Sharp sinker. Even potential for some good break and stuff. Throws really hard. I don't know. Could sound really interesting. Just a 333 ERA last year. Not bad at all. It could be interesting. If they find a way to improve his pitches even more. <laughs> could definitely be interesting. Yankees need some extra arms out there. See how he does in the minors for a while. Give him some outings in spring training. Get a feel for him. Maybe add him to the 40 men. Could be an idea. We'll see. So I think that's an interesting ad. I never really have a problem with a minor league deal, let alone any potentially good, intimidating backup for the Yankees' bullpen. Never going to really hear me having a problem with that. 
And then on December the 1st, just a few days ago, the Yankees did end up claiming Oscar Gonzalez off of waivers from the Guardians. And I saw some people flipping out about it naturally because, you know, they want the big fish with what's out there right now being spoken about amidst the winter meetings and everything. But I look at it as, you know, he's young, just a depth move for the outfield as of now. Definitely not going to be one of the big ones. I mean, I'm aware of that. Lord knows the Yanks can't have enough of that these days as far as outfield depth. They need outfielders, period. But, you know, in order to get the bigger ones, you get those guys, and you'll need backups in case anything goes wrong. It's a depth piece. So that's how I really feel about it. Really no major hit to the payroll either at all. So not really any cons to this as far as I'm concerned. Unless, of course, which I doubt it will be, but unless, of course, like I said before, it's the only move made, then, yeah, then you take to the streets outside of the stadium. But (laughs) as of now... No harm, no foul, really. Just whatever. That's how I feel about it. Good potential depth move. Never really going to take issue with it. As long as it doesn't impact anything else happening. As long as it's not really the only move made. Which, in both counts, I don't really think it's going to be a big deal at all. So, I'm fine with it. It's whatever. On Tuesday the 21st, as of a non-player signing or pickup... We were talking about how this offseason the Yankees ended up having to look for both a bench coach and a hitting coach. We, of course, know that they filled the hitting coach role with James Rosen. The last time we spoke, we spoke about that. But they were still looking for a bench coach to succeed Carlos Mendoza as he went to the Mets to be their new manager after Buck Showalter stepped on out of there. So the Yankees did, as of the last couple of weeks, almost two weeks ago, as of Tuesday, did find their new bench coach already. And it is none other than Brad Osmus, who you might remember years ago managed the Detroit Tigers, played a little bit in the major leagues, and now more or less he'll get to be Aaron Boone's right-hand man in the dugout. So Brad Osmus is the Yankees' new bench coach. So now in the dugout, they're all filled out as far as the vacancies with hitting coach and bench coach. I don't really have too much of an opinion on Brad. He didn't really accomplish much as the Tigers manager. I mean, a big part of a manager's record is the team that he has around him, so I don't really hold a managerial record against a guy all that much, depending on the circumstances. But in his first year managing with the 2014 Tigers, not a brutal team at all, obviously, so it is what it is. He did have a 90-72 and record with them that year. And then, And then after that, it wasn't really... Anything worth noting, really, because in 2015, 74 and 87, 2016, 86 and 75, so it bounced back a little bit, but then 2017, 64 and 98. And they also did manage the Angels in 2019 after taking a year off in 18. And with them, it was a 72 and 90 record. So for his career, he is 386 and 422, which is a win loss percentage of 478. So, won just under 48% of his games. So, not great. And he did give his philosophies a little bit really into the numbers, but also likes to have a little bit of a gut feel for the game. So, I guess that's fine. A lot of people had a problem with it because he started to sound a lot like the Yankees' usual brain trust and thought process, which scares me a little bit too. But with these hires, guys, and I've explained this before, the best input that I could really give is the fact that I'm, I'm mainly just indifferent about it. <laughs> like, I, I'm sorry, I'm just... I just don't think these guys have all that much say. I really don't. I think a lot of the way that things run in the Yankees organization come from Brian Cashman and those directly around him. I'm not saying that I think that guys like Aaron Boone and the hitting coach and the pitching coach Matt Blake and others have no voice. I'm not saying that. I just don't think that they have much input at all. You know, like, yeah, they might throw some ideas around, but then I think that what the higher-ups ultimately want is just what's going to end up happening, regardless of what anybody thinks. And because of that, I just don't really think it to be that big of a deal when just about anybody these days is hired by the Yankees. I don't put too much stock into it. Because I just think to myself, their input probably just goes so far. Probably only goes so far. So, makes me sad to say that. The fact that I'm basically more or less indifferent to just about anybody the Yankees hire, unless it's just like an old-time 
really respected figure in the baseball industry to which point where they may they they may be given the privilege to have more of a voice than certain others do but otherwise i'm just like eh, whatever like the way osmus talks i just i just think he's going to be a regular like just going to be there giving his takes but not sure how how many ideals he's going to get to instill on the players or if he's just going to march to the beat of the drum like a lot of them do or have to or whatever the story may be. I just don't think that a lot of those guys in that dugout get to give... Well, they might give their input, but I don't think it's considered really at all. I think majorly what Hal, what Cashman, and what everybody in Cashman's direct brain trust wants, I think that's what ends up playing out. So, I don't put too much stock into this hire. It's whatever. I hope it goes well, and I'll never crap on a guy before he even gets to coach for a game. So... And that way, I got nothing negative to say. But I also can't really get too excited based off of what I just told you. So that's that. Best of luck to Brad, I suppose. See how he does. And if he does have good ideals, I hope that they're able to be heard within the Yankees clubhouse and utilized throughout the organization because the Yankees could use just about any help they could get, especially after the 2023 they had. I think that goes without saying. And finally, just an interesting talking point I wanted to mention on today's show because very interesting to me and this might be an unpopular opinion if it isn't fine you don't have to listen to it or like it but there's some news that dropped on Wednesday the 29th just a few days ago this past week that Luis Severino obviously this is the least surprising thing of all time in the sense of him not returning to the Yankees I said many times that I highly highly doubt that he'll be back with the Yankees and I didn't even really want him back but Luis Severino signed a contract across town on Wednesday with the New York Mets. Now, I don't have too much of a problem with that in the sense that he's just with the Mets. It's whatever. I was just amazed that, yeah, he only got one year. I'm not surprised by that. Definitely has to be a prove-it deal after the way his career has gone for the last number of years. But the thing that surprised me is that he was signed to a $13 million contract. So hovering close to around $15 million. I mean, listen, I never want to trash talk former Yankees, former players. I mean, especially those who I liked as people. I mean, lots of you know that about me in general, but I also happen to really like Luis Severino as a person. You could tell how he cared, how emotional he got when he was doing badly. He even got legitimately emotional with a lot of the bad things that happened to him this past season. So he cares, and he's a good guy. Or at least he seems, I don't know him personally, but just from what you could see over the television and see how he acts on camera and everything and how he interacts with his teammates and shows how much he cares, he gathers certain opinions about a guy. And from those, all those things that we can all gather, all things considered, Luis Severino seems like a real stand-up guy. Got no issues with him personally, and I wish him all the best. I said that from the start, despite my negative feelings about him as a player and how his career just took a complete and utter downturn for over this last half decade. But got no problems with him as a, as a guy at all. No problems. But in that same breath, you can still say that you think something is objectively kind of ridiculous. And I was surprised that he was signed to this much until some people just apparently told me that this is really the going rate for pitchers nowadays, which is crazy to me. Because if that is in fact the case then salaries are really, I mean, they've been out of control for a while, but they are really, it's getting to a point where it's just staggering, in my opinion. And this isn't even trash talk, guys. It really isn't. It's just a matter of stating facts to prove a point. If you don't like it, then you don't have to listen. But this is wild to me. $13 million? Anywhere near fifteen for Seve? With the way his career has been like for the last six years. That's no small sample size, ladies and gentlemen. Six years. The last time this guy had a respectable, really solid season was 2018. If you're the Mets, or if you're their fans, and you want to watch any Luis Severino hype videos, you're going to watch either the last maybe couple of postseason starts he had that were, you know, really memorable... Or you're going to be watching a lot of things from 2018 and prior. Again, not trash-talking Severino. I got no problem with the guy. I happen to really like him personally. 
It's just a matter of stating fact. To proving a point about the contract and its worth. The one year is not what I take issue with. It should be one year. It should be a prove-it deal. It's just the amount of money that someone who has had even the career that Severino has had the last six plus years and they could still get $13 million? That's like the going rate nowadays? I mean, I know I'm probably starting to sound like an 85-year-old, some kind of boomer out here, but like, I mean, that's crazy to me. That's really what we've gotten to? No trash talking whatsoever. And some people will come to me saying that 2022 was a year of big success for Severino. He, he had 19 starts. He didn't even have 20 starts. I can't call that, like, successful or anything worth noting. The guy hasn't had 20 starts in six years. Yeah, in those 19 starts, it may not have been bad in 2022. But still, you're talking about missing almost half the year. It's a lot of missed time. And a lot of the badness of Luis Severino's career the last six years has been that he just can't stay on the field. And everyone says, oh, well, we, when he is on the field, then he's good. Well, when is he on the field? <laughs> That's the very point that I'm trying to make. If a guy's not on the field to prove his worth, then how can he be worth this kind of money? If he was going to sign a contract, and I expect it to be a one-year regardless, like I said, the one year is not what I have an issue with, I would have expected it to maybe be, I don't know, and I know that Luis Severino's experienced and he's had his good starts in the past, so, and you know, some teams may view it as upside, but upside getting you nearly $15 million, I would expect the contract to maybe be around like 7 8 Some people may consider that to be cruel, but it has been that long <laughs> since Luis Severino's really had himself a great season. ERA, three and a half and under, 30 plus starts. Maybe even some playoff starts to go along with that. It has been over a half a decade, people. If it's just been maybe a couple of years and, you know, there's the upside to go along with that, fine, whatever. But like I said before at the beginning of this, this is no small sample size, my friends. So... Again, I'm not trashing on the guy. Don't wait. It may come off that I am. Fine, whatever. If you want to call it trash talking, fine. It's a matter of perspective, I guess. But I, I'm really not meaning for it to come off that way. Just some objective, truthful discussion on where salaries are, n- are nowadays in general, especially in light of this situation. I, I just think it's gotten to a point. It's crazy. And again, I wish all the best of luck to Severino. And good for him for getting the money. Like, you know, that's no doubt about that. He got the $13 million. Good for him. More power to him. Godspeed. Honestly. God bless the guy. I'm just saying from an objective outside point of view, given how his career has been over the last six years, and yeah, he does have his playoff starts sprinkled into there. And that does have some value, yeah. But when you're talking about that sample size that I'm bringing up, I'm just really surprised that that much missed time and given the fact that he's also coming off of an unspeakably horrible 2023 just completely conquered with injuries and then when he wasn't hurt he was just downright awful most of the time especially coming off the season that he just did to add on to everything I just said I'm just really surprised that that could get a guy 13 million dollars nowadays like I'm sorry I I was just surprised I even tweeted right after. I was like, how the hell did Severino get himself $13 million? I would have definitely expected to be at least maybe around a little bit under 10, like 7 or 8. I don't know. Everyone's saying, oh, upside, upside, upside. What upside? I mean, there might be a little bit of upside because he's not necessarily old. He's going on age 30. He's not He's not a toddler anymore, considered to be in major leagues. You know, he's not a young, young kid anymore. He's not old either, I get that. And he still throws a decent velocity, even though bafflingly so. We spoke about it a lot on this show when we saw it in 2023. His fastball will be maxing out at like 93 sometimes. We're like, what the hell is going on with this guy? So, I don't know, it's just, it's weird. His arm was on the fritz sometimes, it seemed. Even when he was healthy, when he came back from injury this year, he was just getting tagged up all over the place. Fastball didn't have that usual life to it. We were talking all about it for months. So aside from still throwing hard sometimes as of this past season and not being like too old, 
I don't see the extreme upside that some people seem to be alluding to. And then given this last year especially, let alone the last six at large, I was just surprised when he got that money. Call me ridiculous. That's just what I think. My personal opinion. You don't have to like it. You don't have to agree with it. You don't have to listen to it. That's just what I think. But other than that, that's really all of Yankees news, guys. I mean, the Sevy thing wasn't really fully Yankees news. It is in the fact that he was a Yankee for the last bunch of years, and now he no longer is, and just the money thing was just a side piece to it. So that's that. That's really it for Yankees news. I do want to just cap off by saying that I don't want to have that discussion about Severino to come off as disrespectful. Again, I have no problem with the guy, and I wish him all the best. I truly do. I hope Severino proves himself. I hope he earns that money, and I hope he ends up proving to himself yet again that he could be the Severino of old. But like I said, a lot of people are going to have to watch a lot of old, old highlights of Severino get really amped up about him. But nothing's impossible, I guess. Nothing's impossible. He could bounce back and be the Luis Severino of 2018. You're getting pretty far away from that these days, and that's why it's very unlikely like it is, but could happen. It could. You never know. But I definitely thank him for everything. I definitely do, because he did have his good days with the Yankees once upon a time. And it was very painful to see him go through everything that he did, especially this past season, all those times he got emotional and everything. That was very tough to watch. Because, again, got no problem with the guy. No problem with him. So... I do thank him for all the good times, and I wish him the best going forward. And for his sake, internally especially, because I know how much of an internal battle the game must be when you're actually in the spotlight like that and actually on that mound, I hope he proves himself yet again that he can be that elite Luis Severino that he once was again. Because it may be easy for some people to forget, but once upon a time, this guy was supposed to be the ace of the future for the New York Yankees. Can he get back there at all? We'll see. As far as the Mets are concerned, I know that Yamamoto's name is in on them as well, but if they don't get another one on top of this to add to that rotation, if Severino's one of, or even just their only move, that's a yikes, because Severino's a risk. But uh, if they add to that, and Luis Severino ends up being like a side piece to it, then that could be potentially a good signing. And amidst all this, too, Steve Cohen is also entitled to spend his money however he wants as well, so that's part of it. But I just personally, from an outside perspective, was surprised to see that money. But again, I'll end it on a positive note and wish Severino, truthfully, genuinely, the best of luck and thank him for all the good times that he had with the Yankees, because I am truly thankful for that. Wow, we are almost an hour in already. How did we get here? (laughs) My God, time flies. My God. All of the intense winter meetings discussion, guys. And with all this today, packing all this into this episode like this, just getting us to the social media segment right now after almost an hour. My God, so much to cover from these last couple of weeks. I almost hope that I'm doing an episode next Sunday so I can just stay caught up on everything, really, because a lot could happen this week. And like I said, even if, if it does, especially if it's a major move by the Yankees, I will be back next Sunday the 10th to talk about it. But my favorite week of the offseason, we are amidst it. And it's helping me to cope with everything else that is otherwise awful about this time of year that I absolutely hate, i.e. there being no baseball on my TV, the cold coming in, the winter making itself more and more present as the days go along. And speaking of the days going along, the sun continuing to go down earlier and earlier and earlier and earlier and earlier, leading all the way up to the 21st of December. At which point, I start to feel a little bit better already, because then it starts to go the other way around, and we'll start to notice a little bit of a difference in February and March. Sun stays out a little bit later, spring on the horizon, baseball coming back. You know the deal. I don't know how I talk that fast without stuttering sometimes. It's really weird. (laughs) Social media segment, let's go. Shut up, Mike. Yep, let's keep going. All right, so open-ended question for this week. Obviously, with the winter meetings being here, duh, it's going to be a winter meetings question. So, quite simply put, did put it on Twitter earlier, not earlier today actually, actually it was earlier yesterday, because I figured it'd be an easy question to come up with given the circumstances of what's going on. So quite simply put, do you think the Yankees will make any move or moves at this year's winter meetings? And if so, which? I mean, you could also say that you don't think they'll be making any moves. At the winter meetings, you could reply, no, I don't think anything will happen. That's totally fine. But if you're me, 
and want to, for some reason, be a cockeyed optimist, despite how much the Yankees have emotionally beaten all of us to an absolute and utter pulp, you can be that as well. I do think that whether it be the Yankees or somebody else, that something will happen in the winter meetings, but I will go out on a limb and say that I do think that the Yankees will even be doing something during these meetings. I'm going to go out on the longest limb possible and risk the utmost disappointment and heartbreak imaginable and say, for the record, I will hold myself accountable for this. Not just because of all the talk saying that this could get done during the winter meetings. I'm thinking of this personally. Because I do think it would be to the other side's benefit. Obviously to the Yankees' benefit as well, depending on the package. I think me just saying that gave it away. But anyway, let's keep going. I do think that Juan Soto to the Yankees will happen by the conclusion of the winter meetings. Which means by Wednesday night, I believe that Juan Soto will be a Yankee. I believe, and I'm hoping and praying even more so, that that trade package comes down a bit. That the very nature of negotiations takes form to where you start out with something ridiculous and then work your way down. And possibly, even if that package does not come down, then you find a way to basically guarantee that he is extended upon acquisition. Either way, I think if you are Brian Cashman, you absolutely need to find a way to get this done. Now, if you don't have any plans to actually extend him, and he is just a rental, then I, truthfully, while I'll be heartbroken that he is not a Yankee still, and I'll be very upset, I will not fully blame them for still having pause about a package like that. Because whether it be Juan Soto or any just about anybody else, that kind of a package for a one-year rental is objectively insane. I don't blame the Padres general manager for asking for it. That's the point of negotiations. You put out an offer. You negotiate. Maybe it works its way down. You figure it out. You compromise. That happens a lot of the time. Sometimes it doesn't happen and the deal doesn't happen. So we'll see which one plays out here. But I do think that regardless of what the specific detailed outcome is, I do think that the overall outcome will be by Wednesday, Juan Soto is a Yankee. That is a very, very big risk to say. Because it's much more likely that all of us ultimately are disappointed and heartbroken after it doesn't happen. So I'm going out on a limb by saying this and being an optimist when I have no reason to be one. Because I do think it is also in the best interest of both parties involved here for the Yankees to get their hands on Juan Soto before things go on too long. You could possibly lose him, potentially even to a freaking division rival. And I do think it would be to the Padres' benefit so they could shed that payroll they so desperately want to shed and maybe even look elsewhere to make improvements in other areas and also get their hands on some good, solid, young pitching, which I do think the Yankees could provide for them better than anybody, which is why any other suitor is being considered higher than the Yankees for Juan Soto at this point is baffling to me, despite talks having been stalled. So that's why I'm just trying to be patient. Regardless of what the reports say, I'm trying not to get too discouraged at the stalling talks and the package not coming down, supposedly, And I'm also trying not to get too optimistic about talks potentially heating up again and the package coming down. I'm trying to stay grounded, be patient, see how it plays out. That's what I'm trying to do. But even if the Soto deal does not happen before Wednesday night, when after Wednesday night is over, the winter meetings will conclude for this year, I do think the Yankees will make some sort of a move If they don't do that, then I will say that I think they will sign Yoshinobu Yamamoto. Either way, I see the Yankees making one move in the winter meetings. I don't see them making more than one. I see them making either one or none. It's going to be one of those two. 
I'm going to more strongly say Juan Soto. Yamamoto could definitely happen. I'm saying for the record right now that one or the other could happen. I would not be surprised with either. So I wouldn't necessarily be 100% wrong if Yamamoto happens first. But I will go out on the ultimate limb and say that the Juan Soto trade gets done because I feel a trade for both sides is more urgent. Even if people are saying that Yamamoto is still the number one priority for the Yankees, I do think that it is in the best interest of both parties involved to get this trade over with. Get it done. Brian Cashman, I cannot stand the very sound of your voice, the sight of your face, and the thought of your insufferable arrogance. But I am very much relying on you to make sure that this gets done. And I can't really rely on anybody else. You're the damn general manager. So that's what I have to say. One or the other, more primarily Soto, or nothing. Everything else, I think, happens after the winter meetings. Let's hear what some of you guys think before we wrap up the show here. Let's start off with Tina at Mountain Gal 456 saying, Hi, Mike. Hey, Tina. Good to see Yapping Yankees back. Thank you. I guess it's obvious they need to shed payroll so they can get Soto and Yamamoto first and then possibly someone else. I'm sure they won't hear the end of it if they don't get Soto. Yeah, those are my two biggest priorities, my ideal offseason, primarily, make other small moves aside it, but Soto and Yamamoto, that's that's my goal, so yeah, if they don't get him, they definitely won't hear the end of it, especially if word comes out that they very well could have extended him and maybe even the package came down and they still didn't go with it, yeah, but either way, even if the package didn't come down, you'll definitely still have your people out there calling for Cashman's head, I mean, I certainly won't be happy about it. But at the end of the day, if the package doesn't come down and there's nothing you could do and the other team will not go along with anything else and they're just being extra stubborn, there's nothing there's nothing that Cashman will be able to do. But it still is on him to get it done. It still is. And the Yankee community is still going to be a very ugly place if it doesn't. You're absolutely right. I agree. Spencer at Musician DMD says, When the winter meetings conclude, the Yankees will not have made any major trades or acquisitions. Uh, that would stink. Obviously, there's so much left for the offseason, so that doesn't mean it's game over, but that would stink. For all the hot discussion going on, for all the things that could take place over these next few days, for nothing to happen, that would be a very cruel tease. <laughs> At Cashman Sucks NYY says, No, you know what they will say. The price was too high for us. Yeah, we've heard it before. <laughs> Up next, we have at Heaven BND saying, I don't think they will. All right, so if last few in a row saying, you don't think anything's going to happen. All right. At MD Nelly says, because Cashman has a strong track record and we have plenty of evidence, I think the meetings come and go without anything getting done. Quote, we had a lot of conversations and we're close on a few things. We will continue those conversations. We're always motivated to get better, end quote. <laughs> I love all the Cashman impersonations. We do have an awful lot of, of evidence with him saying things like this, and that's why we're able to make fun of him the way that we do. So, you're not wrong. At Mark Plum 63 says, If any, it'll be small. Hal doesn't think higher payrolls win championships. I mean, I, I take a little bit of issue with people saying this, and I'm actually, I'm probably going to take some flack for saying this, but I actually will come to the defense of Hal Steinbrenner in this sense. And I definitely criticize the man plenty for a lot of reasons. And I don't like the guy. I'm not a big fan of his. So don't take this as full-on defense or that I like him. That's not the case. But I do have to defend him in the sense of saying that the payroll is already pretty high, guys. <laughs> it's high. I'm not saying the Yankees can't afford to go even higher, because they can. But it's not low. It's just our boneheaded general manager's fault for not properly allocating it. <laughs> That's the case here. So I do have to slightly come to the defense of Hal Steinbrenner and say it's not like he's running the Yankees like there's some sort of poorhouse. Their payroll is not low. Could it be higher? Yeah. Could they afford for it to go higher? Yeah, the Yankees can afford anything. <laughs> They're worth more money than God. But still, they don't have necessarily a low payroll. It's on Cashman to be smart with said set payroll. 
That's what it really comes down to. Almost any GM out there would love to be told, oh yeah, here's nearly $300 million. Do what you can with it. Give me a championship. Cashman hasn't been able to do that. At Puzo Joe says, hopefully, but lately, the only move they're good at making is excuses for not making a move. <laughs> yeah, the excuses have been pretty frequent these last few years, as we know. Next, we have at John P. McLaughlin says, no. Quote, we kicked the tires on a few things, but nothing came together. We're confident that we can win with the roster as currently constructed, end quote. <laughs> Oh my god, these quotes are scary accurate by you guys. Brian Cashman has done an astronomical amount of mental and emotional damage to us all, hasn't he? Wow. People recite his quotes like a memorized poem. It's crazy. (laughs) Oh my goodness. Alright, let's continue on here. Up next, we got Rebecca at Peace Now for Life, and Rebecca says, I do think some moves will be made at the winter meetings. The Yankees are under a lot of pressure to make this team better. I think Soto and Yamamoto, and possibly Kiermaier, they cannot afford to wait this year. Get it done. Damn. All of that happening within the next few days? By Wednesday night? That'd be pretty crazy. (laughs) That'd be pretty crazy wild though I mean that'd be for being honest that'd be like an A A plus off season for me right there by next Sunday if this were to play out which I don't think it'll happen like that that's absolutely nuts if it did I'd be overjoyed over the moon but by next Sunday I would come on this podcast and say as of December 10th the 2023 off season is officially an A plus for the New York Yankees <laughs> Juan Soto Yamamoto addressing the outfield and starting rotation, and addressing the outfield even further with a terrific defender like Kevin Kiermaier as sort of a B piece to Juan Soto, at least until Jason Dominguez comes back. That would be unbelievable to be able to say by next Sunday, that is done. (laughs) Wow. At Baseball, Tzar says, if so, I think it would come from a trade. It's so hard to predict who, because it depends on other teams' moves, too. I think we sign a mid-to-upper-tier player. My guess would be a Kiermaier type and Yamamoto during the meetings and maybe trade for Class A. Class A for the bullpen. Interesting. Okay. Because I know a lot of people definitely want a closer out there, like a definitive closer. What would he be making in 24? About like 2 to $3 million? I don't know if the Guardians would be willing to move him, though. I mean, I, I can't really see any reason why they wouldn't, because it's not like they're massively competing at the moment or anything, but probably have to put together a decent package for that. I mean, Classe did struggle this year more so than he did in years past. If I'm not mistaken, his ERA was uh, decently higher this year than it was in the past. Yeah, in 2022, 136 ERA. Pitched in 77 games, 42 saves. 2021, 129 ERA. 24 saves. 74 strikeouts in 69 and two-thirds innings. His walks were a bit up this year from 2022 as well. And in 2019, he didn't pitch badly either. 21 games, only one save, so he didn't really close. 231 ERA. And in 2023, 322 ERA. 44 saves, the most he's had so far. And his walks went back up to 16. And he didn't have as many strikeouts. Strikeouts were down as well. And 72 and two-thirds struck out 64. So he had decently less than a strikeout per inning, which is unlike him. Still throwing hard. No question there. Yeah, that'd be a, a hell of a piece to add. But I just, I think the Yankees have bigger priorities right now. But it's not a really outlandish thing to say that you think maybe a lesser move could happen along with a bigger move at the winter meetings, Yamamoto being the big one and Kiermaier being the sort of side move like you mentioned. So either way, I think, I mean, a lot of people here said they don't think anything's going to happen, which I wouldn't be surprised. I think it's really one or nothing. And it's either going to be Yamamoto, Yamamoto or Soto. But here, you still have it being at least one of the big guys. Interesting. 
All right, next we have at Laura underscore Icemont. My good friend Laura says, I believe they'll trade for Soto. They'll negotiate the right price for him. Right now the Padres are asking for too much. That's the only move I see them making. Yeah, fair enough, Laura. That's basically what I said. I definitely think the asking price is astronomical right now. If it's guaranteed that at least as of now it'll be a rental and you just want to wait till next offseason to extend him or if you want to risk him going elsewhere and then sign him in free agency next year, I just think either way, you got to get your hands on Soto. Now, you know, obviously sooner rather than later, so now would be much better. But it's tough when the asking price is that high for someone who is definitely, at least as of this moment, a rental. It's really hard. It's really tough. It's going to be very interesting to see how that plays out over the next few days because you imagine at some point today, maybe they've spoken at least a little bit, the Yankees and the Padres, but you would think that at least tomorrow, I mean, they better between tomorrow and Wednesday, they should have a number of in-person meetings. They really should. And hopefully that leads to things progressing at least a bit. Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully. But I'm glad to see that I'm not the only one out here believing, even if they have no reason to believe, that Juan Soto trade could get done before Wednesday night, or at least maybe even at the very end of the winter meetings on Wednesday night. Who the hell knows? But that would be pretty epic. At B. Welch 1943 says the Yanks will make no significant moves till the Yamamoto signing in January. Okay, so you think Yamamoto won't happen until January. Okay. So nothing happening at the meetings. That's fair. Like I said, it's very possible nothing could happen. At Yankee Ken says Soto, Yamamoto, and Bellinger. Then I realize this is Cashman. So Kiermaier, Montas, and... And we are really effing good and don't dare question the greatness of this front office. (laughs) Yeah, that's why, listen, even if we've been given no reason to hope, that's why I said that. Even if we have no reason to feel optimistic. Because that could very well happen. I mean, yeah, they could very well end up taking another small risk on Montas again and signing him to a very small contract like we've mentioned a number of times since the offseason began could be very possible that the Yankees do, especially if they end up having to give away that pitching talent in a potential Soto package. Then, yeah, but like I said, if Kiermaier ends up being like the biggest move, then that's when I'm not okay with Kevin Kiermaier at all. But if he's to go alongside a Soto, a Lee, or a Bellinger, that's when it's okay for me. More than okay. Because Kiermaier, although he's not necessarily the best of hitters he is a lefty does put the bat on the ball as much as he can and more so than anything he is a damn vacuum cleaner out there in center field he is a terrific outfielder terrific defender how many times has he tormented the Yankees in center field taking away how many hits from how many of our guys please it's crazy so if he were a side move to one of those bigger outfielders I'd be very happy with that would not take issue with it at all But yeah, so that's what you're led to believe with Cashman in charge. I don't blame you at all, my guy. (laughs) Up next is my good friend James at Rebirth Chaos 09 saying, I think they have to, and I think it's going to be things they need to address, like a lefty bat. And pitching is going to be guarded because I don't know if they will get Soto or Yamamoto, but those would be the moves to get. The Yankees are under a lot of pressure to make big changes. Yeah, they, they definitely are. But I just think it's really in the interest of both parties in the Soto case to just get this done. Get it done with. It's already the first week of December. Time's going to fly before you know it. And this is not something that you want to drag along for a while. I also think it'd be in the Yankees' best interest to get this done so they get a better idea as to their payroll after a trade like this is done to see what they could do about Yamamoto. So I, I do think that Soto should be a bigger priority than Yamamoto. I do. I do realize that the rotation is also a priority. I do. It's just I think with all the things that Soto could add and what he could mean to this team going forward, I'm sorry, he's just number one for me. Sorry. That's just how I felt from the beginning. I'm not going to switch up on it. That doesn't devalue Yamamoto's worth in my eyes. I still very much think that he is beyond worth getting. It's just the Yankees have a lot of work to do. They really do. And Soto does mean that much. So, 
you do think that someone will happen because they have to. It has to happen, you're saying, James. Fair enough. I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to because there is a, a lot of the offseason to go. But it would certainly be nice for it to happen at the winter meetings, that's for sure. I'm, I'm inclined to agree there. All right, let's do the usual final two, as always. First up, my girlfriend at Vic Salimo, and she says, If anything does happen, I think it'll be pretty minor. Otherwise, I do not see anything happening at the winter meetings. Well, I mean, fair enough. We've been saying it. There's really not too much reason to be optimistic when it comes to Brian Cashman and the Yankees, but... Uh, Sometimes you just got to remain optimistic nonetheless because it is the only thing standing in the way of complete and utter insanity and not being able to deal with it anymore. <laughs> just the constant disappointment, especially after how 2023 went. Oh, God. It'd be awesome if something does happen, but listen, it's not the total end of the world because, like I said, plenty of offseason left to go after this. So if nothing happens, then, yeah, it would suck, especially with all the anticipation and the rumors and the excitement. But, you know, plenty of winter meetings have come and gone without anything happening, and people saying, holy crap, that was boring, and not even really getting the point of it. <laughs> so, we'll see. Hopefully these winter meetings don't have that, because some of the biggest names in recent memory up for discussion this offseason makes for a lot of excitement, so I hope at least one of them gets settled, whether it's the Yankees or otherwise, even if it's Otani with another team. That'd be cool to see. Something. Anything. Make it happen. But with the Yankees, I don't blame you for feeling that way, Vic. Definitely not. And last but not least, as always, is my mom, Julia Gina Scudero. And she says, I think that, of course, the Yankees will indeed make some kind of move in four days within the winter meetings time. Whether it'll be a move that makes no big difference is the question. Sadly, with Cashman making his colossal selections these last bunch of years... It is a bit concerning that this man has a hard time parting with anyone on the team he should depart with for the betterment of the team for true quality players. I guess we'll see. I'm hoping to be dead wrong. Please, Yankees, do the right thing. That's all we can hope for. And I definitely know what you're talking about, Mom. You've heard me going around the house for weeks now just begging for Juan Soto. Probably sick and tired of hearing me say it, but that's uh, that's what's been going around around the Scudero household lately. Just been talking a lot about Juan Soto. But, yeah, I was definitely talking before the package that has been revealed in the last day or two. That seems to be pretty real because a lot of the reporters seem to be aligned on it. But before this, I was saying, oh, you know, if it's a package of three, maybe four guys and Michael King's in it and nobody else really too major because, I mean, Michael King alone, as far as value, especially transitioning to a starter, is very valuable. I mean, yeah, there's always the risk he could blow his arm out, and it wouldn't be the first time, unfortunately, either, but he is very valuable, especially with how he threw in 2023. He definitely proved himself yet again after his elbow problems prior. And then maybe somebody else like a Randy Vasquez or a Johnny Brito, like has been mentioned, that's fine, and maybe another prospect in there. But, I mean, to throw Clark Schmidt in there as well, on top of Michael King and Randy Vasquez and Johnny Brito, plus two prospects, plus taking on Trent Grisham and Drew Thorpe. It's like, it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot for something that as of right now is a rental. It's a lot. But, listen, it's something that they have to work out. And you just hope that the package comes down, a deal could be made. Because Juan Soto to the Yankees really has to happen. It just has to. I'm sorry. Look at it. <laughs> My sanity almost relies on it. <laughs> oh, God. You think I want Juan Soto on the Yankees? I don't know. It's pretty debatable. But outside of your reply, Mom, that is all for this week's social media segment and for episode 203 of Yapping Yankees. As always, I thank you all so much for participating in the social media segment if you do or just listening in general and tuning in and spending another crazy Sunday night slash Monday morning, Monday afternoon, evening, any other time of the week you're listening to me with me. You know, I appreciate it to no end, guys. I love each and every one of you so much for even dedicating a second of your day to my crazy self and my show and my content and my opinions. I appreciate it to the ends of the earth. And if you guys didn't know that prior, then please know it now. But otherwise, again, 
203 wrapped up, guys. A lot to cover. I know I just sort of like dove right into it right at the beginning, but that's because there was really no time to waste. <laughs> There's plenty to talk about today, plenty to get through, plenty to be hyped about, maybe not hyped about, and just get through with Yankees news and whatnot. Lots of talk today, as I'm sure you can imagine. After two weeks of not speaking, and the first day of the winter meetings being today, and all the rumors that have been swirling around the blazing hot, hot stove the last few days, that's what we have to do for today, just dive right in. But going forward, it's the same deal as it was before, bi-weekly for the offseason, so if nothing noteworthy happens the next few days, nothing happens really at all until next Sunday, then I'll be back at you in two Sundays on December the 17th. But if something does happen at all within the next week, whether it be right after the winter meetings or during them, and it's major, and it's worth an episode, definitely. I mean, even if it's not something crazy, if it's something that really is a step forward in addressing the Yankees' issues, I will be right back here next Sunday on the 10th to talk about it with you, yap about it together, and give our thoughts on it. That's how the off-season format goes. It is not unconditionally bi-weekly. It is bi-weekly as long as nothing happens. <laughs> but if something does happen, you best believe I'm coming back for a second week in a row. That's how it works. But whether or not I am back next Sunday, there is something that you should remember to do that I remind you at the end of each and every episode, and that is to follow me on all social medias, guys, if you don't already. Facebook, my fan page is Mike Scudero and Y. Twitter, or X, whatever it's deciding to call itself today amidst its identity crisis. You can follow me at Mike Scudero, and Instagram is Mike Scuds 97 Subscribe to Yapping Yankees on all four of the platforms it is available on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, and SoundCloud. Show your love across all four like you all always do such a great job at doing, my friends. And if you missed any Yapping Yankees episodes, episodes 34 all the way up to episode 203 today, those are all available on YouTube. So about 170 episodes worth or so on YouTube. And every single Yapping Yankees episode, all 203 of them, are available on Apple, Spotify, and SoundCloud. Once again, I thank you, 3000, for listening to me yap today. As always, my friends, I have been your host, Mike Scudero, and I will talk to you. Well, kind of depends. Like I said, if anything happens over the course of the next week, then I'll be back at you next Sunday, December 10th. But if nothing at all really happens of note, then I will talk to you again in two Sundays as per the bi-weekly format of Yapping Yankees in the offseason, December the 17th, when I come at you with episode 204 of Yapping Yankees. But until then, guys, as always, hang in there, be patient, stay safe, look out for your loved ones. Go ahead and kick life's ass this week, my friends, whether or not something happens this week with the Yankees or otherwise. And also, just stay glued to your phones the next few days for any major breaking news. Fingers crossed. Prayers up. Something happens this week at the meetings. Please, Brian. Please get something noteworthy done. For all the pain you've caused us and the crap you've talked alone, please get it done. <laughs> You're so all-knowing and great. Do your job, Cashman. Make things right to the best of your ability. It is quite literally your job. Address the areas of need, and let's get Juan Soto into the Yankees' pinstripes for the love of everything holy. That's really all I got, guys. No sound effects even in this episode, just all business. That's what these days require, all business during what I consider to be the apex of the offseason, the winter meetings. So let's just <laughs> hope for the best. Otherwise, as per usual, my friends, take care and let's go Yanks. Yanks.